Good morning. It is good to be here, is it not? It's good to see our uh, familiar faces. It's also good to see some visitors as well. Uh, we want to welcome you here. We hope that you'll be uh, back again with us tonight at 5 o'clock, and hopefully you'll uh, join us again on Wednesday for Bible study as well. And Be with us any time that you can. Uh, we're glad that you are here. If you would, look with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, and uh, we'll going, uh, we're going to uh, spend some time there uh, this morning, and we'll look there in just a few moments, but uh, keep your place there in Philippians uh, chapter 3. This morning we want to speak concerning the Christian's timeline, the Christian's timeline. We want to dedicate some time this morning to talk about time, in fact. You know, time is the only thing standing between us and eternity. And once our time in this life is up, then eternity begins. And so the question is, how have we been spending our time? How do we uh, spend our time on a daily basis? Uh, because how we spend our time affects where we will spend our eternity one day. You know, Benjamin Franklin once stated, do not squander time for that is the stuff life is made of. You know, the, the time and the, and the life that we have here, right now, is the only chance we have to prove our faithfulness to God. Once that time is up, there, there is no more second chances. And so that time that we do have right now is so very valuable, very precious. In fact, we could say that the time that we do have is perhaps one of the most, if not the most, precious resource that we have. Not only that, but uh, many who I've talked to have, have told me that time flies. Uh, I'm beginning to see that that's the case. Time does fly, and that's a biblical principle as well. James chapter 4 and verse 7 says that our life is like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And so if it is the case that time is one of our most precious resources and we don't have a whole lot of it, then we need to use that time very wisely while we have it. Again, that's the only thing standing between us and eternity. And so this morning for our lesson, we want to look at the Christian's time. How do we spend our time? We want to look at the past, the present, and the future. And we're going to look at the Christian's timeline and see how we should view each of these aspects of time. How should we view our past? What should we be doing right now in the present? And what about the Christian's future? All these things, I believe, we find in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. Look with me there. I'd like you to notice with me here what Paul says about this verse. Again, I believe we see here past, present, and future. And Paul tells us how we should view each of these aspects of our time. Philippians chapter 3, notice with me verse 13. This is our main verse uh, for this morning's lesson. The Bible says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Again, we see here these three aspects of our time. Past, present, and future. As far as, far as the past is concerned, Paul says we need to be forgetting those things which are behind. As far as the present is concerned, he says here that we need to be reaching towards our future. And as far as the future is concerned, Paul says that there are indeed things ahead for us as Christians that we can expect. And so that's what we want to look at this morning, the Christian's timeline. And our main points for this morning, just three simple ones, the past, the present, and the future. So let's look at these together. First of all, number one, the past. The past, as we know, is behind us. There's nothing we can do to change that. It is, it is uh, set in stone. It is unchangeable. We cannot go back and, and fix or redo anything. And while we've done some good things in our past, we've also more specifically done some bad things in our past as well. Every single one of us, we have sinned. We have fallen short of God's glory. And I know that there are things in each of our lives we wish that perhaps we could take back. There are words, there are actions that we have done that are regrettable. But again, as far as the past is concerned, we can't go back and change that. It is behind us. And Paul has something to say about our past. 
Look with me here again, Philippians chapter 3. I want us to read again verse 13. Start with me from the beginning. Let's see what he says here about the past. Philippians chapter 3, 13, the Bible says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. So let's take a moment and break this down a little bit. First of all, he says that there are things behind us. And so the question is, what are those things that he's referring to? What are those things in the past that Paul is talking about the need to forget them? Of course, he's talking about sin. Sin is, of course, what he is referring to. Uh, there is nothing else in all the Bible that emphasizes the uh, man's biggest problem. That is sin. Sin is something that every single one of us have, have participated in our life in. We've, we've lived for sin and it's a part of every single one of our past, and Paul's saying that it needs to stay there. And so as far as those things behind us are concerned, he's talking about sin. There's nothing else he could be referring to here. That's man's biggest problem. We need to leave those things behind. But he says here also, he uses the word forget. The word forget. And we need to make sure we understand how he's using the word forget, because that determines what he's talking about here in this context. So consider with me, first of all, how the original language defines it and how he is using it here. Strong's says uh, it means to loose out of the mind or to neglect, it could mean. Thayer says that this could mean to no longer care for something. It could mean forgotten or it could mean to give over to oblivion. So this is how the original language defines the word forget. And we're going to bring these up in just a moment. And so looking at this definition and looking at this context, how is he using it? Is he saying, is Paul saying in using the word forget that we're to somehow not remember every bad thing that we've done? Is that what Paul's saying? Is he saying that we're to forget the fact that we have ever sinned? Well, no, I don't believe he's saying that at all. I don't believe he's, he's saying that we're to forget uh, that we forget the bad things that we've done. In fact, uh, if you were here for our summer series, there was a lesson on forgiveness. And uh, it was mentioned in that lesson, you know, that old cliche, you know, forgive and forget. And while that is true in a sense, it's also not true in a sense. Yes, we forgive wholeheartedly. We, we never bring up those wrongdoings once we've forgiven them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we can forget all the wrong things that have been done to us or the wrong things that we have done in our life. It's kind of impossible to do. Um, it's not really a skill set of ours to banish a memory from our minds. We don't have that capability. And so, no, I don't believe that's what Paul's saying here, that we're to forget every bad thing that we've done. It's kind of impossible to do. In fact, if that was what Paul was saying, then he would be contradicting himself because on several occasions, Paul himself brought up his past. And so if that's what Paul was saying, then he would be contradicting himself. Paul, why are you bringing up the past if you're supposed to be forgetting it? Well, again, that's not what he means. In fact, we could also include the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9-10. through 10. Paul there brings up the past sins of some brethren, not holding it against them, but mentioning what they used to do. He says, and he's very explicit there, some of you were homosexuals, some of you were sodomites and extortioners. He's very explicit there. And so again, if Paul is saying that we're to forget, as in forget every bad thing we've done, then he'd be contradicting himself. That's not what he's saying. And so how is Paul using the word forget in this context? What Paul is saying here, how he's using the word forget, is not to forget that we sinned, but to forget sin's influence in our life, its place in our life. We once served sin, and we served it well. Wouldn't you agree? But now we serve a new king. He has been uh, placed on the throne of our lives, and we serve him, Jesus Christ. And so, as we're seeing here, sin once had a place in our lives. No longer. If we're Christians, that should no longer be the case. We need to leave those impulses in the past. In fact, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 3 that we have spent enough of our past lifetime doing the will of the Gentiles. Peter brings up the past, and he says as far as those past things, those sins, it's time to leave those in the past where they belong. 
Again, remembering the definitions we looked up concerning this. Strong says that this could mean to neglect. That's the idea. Not necessarily to not remember it, but to neglect it. Thayer also says it means to no longer care for it. He also says, and I think this is the strongest phrase that he uses here, to give it over to oblivion or destruction. And that's how we should view sin in our life. We should give it over to destruction. It is dead to us. Look with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6, very briefly. Romans chapter 6. I'd like you to notice with me verses 6, 11, and 12. This is a, a context uh, concerning our baptism and how when we were baptized, when we became a new creature in Christ, we put to death that old man, that old person of sin. And as far as sin is concerned, it no longer has a place in our lives. Romans chapter 6 Read with me verses 6, 11, and 12. Verse 6, the Bible says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Verse 11, Likewise you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. In other words, we once served sin as our master. That is no longer the case. As far as our service to sin, it is gone. It is in the past. It is done with. And that, should how we, that should be our view in relation to sin. And so looking again to Philippians 3 and verse 13, that's what Paul says about the Christian's past. Not necessarily to forget that we sin, to forget every bad thing we've done, but to forget sin's influence in our life. Sin has been a part of every single one of our past, and it should stay in the past. It should not be a part of our present. Now, concerning the present, Paul also has something to say. Look with me again back to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Of course, we know that the present, it is right now. The present is at this very moment. And what we do with our right now will ultimately determine where we spend our eternity and of course, we're going to talk about in a few moments our eternity. We're going to talk about the Christian's future and what that's like. But if we truly want to attain that glorious future that we're trying to get to, then there's something we have to do right now in the present. And Paul tells us what that is. Look with me here in your Bibles. Philippians chapter 3, let's read once more verse 13. The Bible says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward. That's what Paul says we're to be doing right now. That is present tense. We should be reaching forward, Paul says. Now, what does that mean to reach forward? Well, Thayer says that this literally means to stretch to or stretch towards out to something. To stretch out to or stretch out towards something. And, and that to and towards is very significant here. It's not just a, a stretching out. It's stretching to and towards something. It's a direction. It, we're trying to attain something. That's the idea here. We're reaching, stretching to grab and lay hold of something is the idea here. That's what we should be doing right now in our present. Reaching, stretching towards our future. Now, consider with me the verses surrounding verse 13, because there are two other phrases that Paul uses that are very similar. And I want us to take notice of these. Notice with me verse 12. Um, we'll not read this, but he says here, he uses the phrase, press on. And that phrase, press on, according to Strong, it literally means to pursue. That's the same idea as that stretching forward. We're reaching for something. We're pursuing something. We're going after something. That's the idea. Verse 14, he uses the phrase, I press toward. Uh, Thayer again says that this means to pursue. Again, that idea of reaching, stretching, trying to take hold and lay hold of something in the future. That is what we are to be doing right now in our present. Trying to attain a better future. And I believe this theme is found all throughout Scripture. So consider with me just for a few moments some, some other passages that, that bring to mind this idea as to what we are to be doing right now in the present. One thing that we're to do in the present is we are to be diligently seeking our God, are we not? You know, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6 speaks to that idea. 
The Bible tells us there that uh, faith is, uh, that without faith it is impossible to please God. And those who come to Him must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. As you see there, there's something that must be done now. We must diligently seek Him. And if we do that, if that's what we're doing in our present, then we will be rewarded for that. We could also mention the words of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11. Now, this context here too speaks to that diligence. And there's an example used in Hebrews chapter 4 because here the Hebrew writer brings to mind the Israelites in the desert and how they could not enter the promised land that rest because of their disobedience. And so the Hebrew writer goes on to say, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest lest we fall according to the same example of disobedience. Again, we see there there's something that we need to do right now. We must be diligent if we are to one day enter that rest. We could uh, add the words of 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. The Bible tells us there to be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Right now we need to be working. We need to be laboring in the Lord's work. And my friends, we can be assured that that labor is not in vain. Paul, in 1 Corinthians, he mentions in uh, chapter 15, excuse me, chapter 9, verses 24 through 25, there he compares the Christian life to a race. And he says there that it, just like in a race, you run in order to get the prize. And he says, you too, in your Christian life, in your Christian race, run in such a way that will cause you to lay hold of that prize. If we want to lay hold of that prize, that reward one day, if we want to reach it to the end of the finish line, there's something we must do now. We must run, Paul says. That's something that must be done in the present. We can mention also in relation to that running, the endurance that's needed to run. Hebrews 12.1 mentions, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles, and let us run with patience. Some versions say, let us run with endurance the race set out for us. And looking back two chapters to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 36, we notice there the same idea. These Hebrew Christians were about to be disqualified from that race. They were about to turn their backs on Christ. They weren't running as they should. They had slowed down. They weren't running to win the prize anymore. They were about to go back to Judaism, to the law of Moses. And the Hebrew writer says there, you know what you need? You need endurance so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. If we want to receive that promise, there's something that must be done right now in our present. We must endure. All these verses that we've mentioned, they all mention some kind of goal in mind. We've mentioned a reward, a rest, a prize, a promise. Philippians 3 mentions uh, things ahead. It mentions the goal. It mentions the prize as well. And if we want to attain such goals, the Bible tells us that there's something that must be done. We must be diligently seeking. We must be abounding in work, running with endurance. Going back to Philippians 3, we must be pressing on, pressing forward, and reaching forward. If we want a good future, my friends, then we must be doing those things right now in our present. And that's what Paul says about what we're to be doing for our present. That's one aspect of the Christian timeline. But again, all these things that we're to be doing right now, they're done for a reason, to have a better future. And Paul, too, here in Philippians chapter 3, mentions our future. Look with me here again, if you're still there in your Bibles, to Philippians 3. Let's read this, let's read this verse again once more. Philippians 3, verse 13. What does Paul say about the future? The Bible says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. As far as the Christian's future is concerned, Paul says there are things ahead for us. And what will be ahead for the Christian is promising. We can look forward to that. We are excited for those things. Now, we've mentioned again in just those previous verses kind of what... Uh, kind of a, a description of what our future is like. Again, we mentioned a reward. We mentioned a rest, a prize, a promise. And while these are descriptions of what our future will be like, these are vague descriptions. These really don't tell us what exactly we're going to attain. 
And so, for the last few moments of our time this morning, I'd like us to notice just three. Uh, three of the many uh, things ahead that Paul says that we will have in our future. Notice with me here in Philippians 3, Paul actually goes on to tell us at least two things ahead for the Christian. Notice with me the first found in verse 20. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, the Bible says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says here, we have a new citizenship, and it is in heaven. You know, I don't know what God looks like, none of us do, but we know that's going to be majestic. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be uh, an amazing sight to behold when we get to see Him face to face one day. And we get to be citizens. We get to dwell in the place where God dwells, a place that, that, that God has resided. We get to be citizens of that place. And that is mind-blowing to think about. Now, if you notice here in verse 20, he says here that this citizenship is present tense. We are currently citizens of that city. He says our citizenship is in heaven. We are currently citizens of heaven. Now, of course, we have not reached our home yet. We have not reached our eternal destination just yet. That's why Peter calls us more than, more than once pilgrims and sojourners. We are on a pilgrimage. We are journeying through this life to a destination. We are citizens of that eternal city. And that's why everyone looks at us differently. We don't think like them. We don't talk like them. We don't, we don't do things the way they do because we're not from here. <laughs> we are citizens of heaven. We should act like it. We should think like it. We should speak like it. And that, my friends, is what we are guaranteed in our future. We are currently citizens, but we'll get to actually enter those gates one day if we are faithful at this present time. And that is just one of many things that we can look forward to for our future. Another that we find here in Philippians chapter 3, notice with me verse 21. Verse 21, the Bible says, Who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself. Paul says here that our bodies will be transformed. Our bodies, the, the ones that we have now, the ones in, in, that, that we uh, live and grow in every day, the ones that we occasionally feel such things as pain and, and ailments and sickness, soreness, frailty of any kind, this body that we have will be changed. It will be transformed. We'll no longer feel those things any longer. And that, my friends, is a fascinating truth that our bodies will be transformed, the Bible tells us. Now, as far as what that transformation will be like, we have no idea. The, the Scripture tells us. John tells us in 1 John chapter 3, and verse 2, it has not been revealed what we shall be, but we shall be like Him. That's all we know. In other words, we don't know what that's going to be like, but it's going to be amazing. <laughs> it's going to be something to look forward to. We'll just have to wait and see is what he's saying. And, and, and we can take that as a guarantee that we will not be disappointed at this transformation. That is a fascinating truth that Paul tells us here. And that's one of those things that we can look forward to. One last passage I'd like us to look to together. If you would, look with me in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is another one of those things ahead that we can mention. Now, let me give you some background here as to what's going on. Uh, these Christians, at this time in the first century, they believed that Jesus was coming back very soon. Very, very soon. In fact, uh, they were perhaps thinking on a time scale of, of days to maybe even a few years. And we know that because they were concerned for their brethren in Christ who had died. They were worried that they had missed Christ's second coming. And so Paul writes this context to put their minds at ease, to comfort them, to let them know that, hey, they're not going to miss anything. And so really what we're seeing here in this context, Paul paints a picture for us as to what the last day on earth is going to look like. He tells us what the last day is going to be like, and he, he gives us a scene as to what Jesus coming back will be like. Let's look at this together. The, the, the point I want us to notice is found at the end of verse 17. But let's read this context together. 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 13. The Bible says, 
But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So again, Paul paints a picture for us as to what the last day on earth is going to look like. This is that scene of earth's last day. Christ will come. He will will descend from heaven with a shout of an archangel. The the trumpet will sound and we will meet him in the air with the uh, saints who died in Christ long before us. And we'll meet them in the air. But the most important thing I want us to notice here, as far as our future is concerned, is what we read the very last of verse 17. He says here that we will always be with the Lord. My friends, that is what our future holds. We will always be with our Savior. Not only are we going to see Him for the first time, not only will our joy be overwhelming from that moment on, but we will get to be with Him forevermore. And that, my friends, is what Paul says about our future. There are things ahead for us if we're doing something now in the present and if we're leaving behind the past. So we've looked at the Christian timeline this morning, the past, the present, and the future as far as, as Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. He says that our past in living for sin, uh, we need to neglect it. We need to uh, get rid of those impulses and its influence completely. As far as our our present, living right now, uh, Paul says we need to be reaching for that glorious future. Reaching, pressing, pursuing, seeking it wholeheartedly so that we may attain it. And finally, he says of our future that there are things ahead for the Christian. And we've noticed what some of those things are. Glorious things, my friends. We have uh, uh, such blessings in this life and in the life to come. And at this time, we want to extend the invitation. Now, I want to speak to those who are not Christians. If you're not a Christian, then you're missing out on all these wonderful things. You know, we're going to talk tonight uh, about singing. And I, well, I was going to mention one song, that there's a, there's a great day coming. There is a great day coming. But there's also a sad day coming for those who have never obeyed the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that we have done that. We need to make sure that we're faithful to Him right now in our present. If there are some here who are Christians and we've not been living as we should, we encourage that you do so. If anyone has any need at any time, please let it be known as we stand and as we sing.